In today's video, we're discussing a potential trade between the Montreal Canadiens and the New York Islanders, something that we might see happen at the NHL draft, or at least discuss the possibility if it makes sense. We also have some trade talk involving Alex DeBrinkett and the Blackhawks, the Edmonton Oilers and Tyson Berry. We have several signings, some coaching updates, including Barry Trotz, Bruce Cassidy's off to Vegas, all that and more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL news and rumors to discuss here today. Uh, first up, we get news today that the longtime NHL goalie Carter Hutton is announcing his retirement from the NHL. So, of course, Carter Hutton uh, was a, probably fair to say a little bit of a late-blooming goaltender, uh, but ended up playing a, a fairly successful career, in my opinion. Had a good run with Nashville, as well as St. Louis, Buffalo, and Arizona. Technically finished up with Toronto uh, as he was acquired at the NHL trade deadline. Um, so really overall, I think Carter Hutton was mostly a backup for probably half of his career. The other half, he was a starter or a tandem kind of guy. Uh, when he was in St. Louis, he had a good run with him and Jake Allen as a tandem. Uh, of course, had a chance to go to Buffalo via free agency and become the starter there. Um, the last few years of his career weren't quite as good, but he did have a good run there as a pretty decent NHL goaltender. So best of luck to Carter Hutton in retirement. We have several signings, mostly prospects here. A few uh, re-signings as well, including the Oilers announcing today that they've re-signed Brad Malone to a two-year, two-way contract. Of course, uh, Malone's been with the Oilers organization for some time now. Mostly plays in the American Hockey League, uh, but he has been called up from time to time. Served his purpose uh, as a bottom six forward with the Oilers a bit during the regular season and occasionally in the playoffs too. Uh, of course, Brad Malone gets a pretty good AHL salary because of the, the, the experience and leadership he brings to their uh, team in Bakersfield as well. So his average annual value at the NHL level is 762.5, and the AHL salary is 250,000, which is one of the higher paid AHL players. We also got news that the Avalanche are signing uh, Lucas Sedlak, who's a winger or a centerman. He plays both positions. He's 29 years old, a former Columbus draft pick way back in 2011. He did eventually come over uh, to North America and played three seasons with the Jackets from uh, 2016 to 2019. Uh, then he ended up going back uh, to play over in the KHL where he was last year. He put up 43 points in 49 games. So we'll see if the uh, return of Lucas Sedlak will be a, a little bit more successful than it was last time or where he'll fit with the Avalanche going into next year. Uh, the Florida Panthers have also signed an undrafted prospect out of Europe, Anton Lefci. He's a left winger, 26 years old from Finland, gets a one-year contract, 925000 I know comments from GM Bill Zito uh, confirmed uh, the signing today, and he did say that he was one of the higher-scoring European forwards amongst the European leagues, so certainly one of the uh, more interesting guys. So we'll see where that goes. Hard to say what uh, will come from it. Some of these players, like they're a little bit older, more mature, been playing at the pro hockey level in Europe, so uh, it's hard to say how the, the game will transition for them. Uh, the Buffalo Sabres also have a signing here today. They've announced a signing for a two-year entry-level contract for prospect Philip Cedarvis. So he gets a, a, a two-year deal. Uh, he's a winger. Uh, he was a 2019 fifth-round draft pick, 21 years old, been playing over in the SHL. So that's all we have for signing news here for today. Uh, we're almost set for the, for the Memorial Cup. Of course, this is the biggest trophy in junior hockey uh, where you have the uh, the three Canadian junior hockey leagues, the OHL, WHL, and QMJHL league champions all come together along with the host city to do battle for the Canadian hockey, junior hockey supremacy. So, of course, that gets uh, tournament gets underway next week here, uh, not too far from me in St. John, New Brunswick, uh, hosted by the St. John Sea Dogs. Of course, we've known for some time that the St. John Sea Dogs would be a part of the tournament. Uh, and they were hoping to win the Quebec League Championship. Of course, they fell pretty short on that, uh, getting eliminated in the second round. Uh, so they'll be joined by Quebec League President's Cup champion Chewinigan. Their series wrapped up just the other night where they defeated the Charlottetown Islanders in the League Championship Series. Uh, the MVP for the Quebec League playoffs was Maverick Bork, a former first-round pick and prospect for the Dallas Stars. Uh, he, along with uh, Oilers uh, prospect Xavier Burgo, uh, certainly have had a heck of a playoff run together. It'll uh, be interesting to see what they can do here at the Memorial Cup. And the Western Hockey League, they have their 
Uh, playoffs are complete now. The Edmonton Oil Kings are league champions and headed to the Memorial Cup as well. Uh, MVP for the Western Hockey League playoffs was Ham's prospect, Caden Gooley. So he had a, a heck of a playoff run there. So he's also got a pretty stacked team at Edmonton. I would have to think that the Edmonton Oil Kings very well could be the odds-on favorites to be Memorial Cup champions. Of course, you have former first-round pick goaltender Sebastian Kosa between the pipes, who has been phenomenal. Uh, Red Wings prospect. Uh, they have Dylan Gunter uh, up front as a Coyotes prospect. You got St. Louis Blues, former first rounder, Jake Neighbors, who did get a taste of the NHL this year. Of course, he's uh, on the team, team captain as well. You got Luke Prokop as well as a defenseman. Uh, they have a really stacked team, really a good group of players there, and I have to think they're going to stand an excellent chance. The only team we don't know yet for this tournament is the team representing the OHL. So that series is between the Windsor Spitfires and the Hamilton Bulldogs, and that is going to Game 7, uh, which is taking place tomorrow night. So we don't know the OHL champions just yet, but one more game will settle the score. We'll either have the Hamilton Bulldogs and Mason McTavish, uh, Ducks prospect, heading to the Memorial Cup, or we'll see uh, players like Wyatt Johnson and the Windsor Spitfires heading there instead. So we'll see, but it should be fun action. Uh, obviously, it'll be held over the course of about, uh, I think it's about a week and a half it takes for the whole tournament, and we'll see who will be the, uh, the Memorial Cup champions here for the first time uh, in a couple of years since the last two years have shut down uh, the Memorial Cup due to COVID. Now, on to some other news today. Of course, if you didn't catch the video just a, out a short time ago, we finally have some news in the coaching world with the Vegas Golden Knights announcing they've hired Bruce Cassidy to be their next head coach. Of course, I do have a dedicated video on the channel talking about that. I'll link it up in the YouTube cards up here so you can watch that if you haven't had a chance to already. I think it's a terrific fit. Uh, that's a great job, but obviously between he and Barry Trotz, we're right at the top of a lot of NHL teams' list. I know Elliot Friedman today was talking a bit about Barry Trotz on the Jeff Merrick show uh, on Sportsnet Radio and uh, talked about the possibility that what might be holding up a Barry Trotz decision has been long rumored that Barry Trotz has ambitions to get into management once he's done coaching and there are some that think that he may be trying to negotiate a clause in his contract and maybe he can coach for a few years and then transition into a management role. Doesn't automatically mean he'd be trying to be the GM right away uh, but something that keep him involved in hockey operations but not be behind the bench so uh, obviously some teams might be more interested in that than others uh, and he may be trying to work something out in that regard so that might be kind of what's holding things up on on trots um of course we don't really know of course vegas was one of the teams though that he had been speaking to for uh what the rumor mill had been suggesting so obviously they're out on trots they've got their man in bruce cassidy um so if, if trots can get a, a decision made here with all the teams he's spoken to then that should really open up the uh, the coaching carousel to kind of get some other guys landing on their feet here in different cities that uh, obviously have lots of vacancies left to be filled. Now on to the rumor mill section for today. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit further about Alex DeBrinket. Now, of course, we know DeBrinket um, has been uh, obviously a hot topic here as of late since the Frank Valley Daily Faceoff.com article came out a few days ago with his uh, NHL trade bait list, the first one for the NHL offseason here. Uh, and he made a pretty bold statement in that article saying that it's not a matter of if Alex DeBrinket is going to be traded. It is when. So he is convinced it's definitely going to happen. And if it doesn't happen this offseason, that Alex DeBrinkett will be one of the prime trade candidates, probably right at the top of the list, come the next NHL trade deadline before next year's playoffs. So uh, I also saw a new article today in The Athletic by uh, Scott Powers, another one as well by Mark Lazarus. They've kind of both wrote different articles here from different perspectives, both Chicago writers for the Hawks and the Athletic uh, with a great platform. Um, and Powers wrote why it made sense, and Lazarus uh, wrote more about why they should keep him. Um, now, of course, from the Scott Powers perspective, which is I tend to agree with a little bit more, uh, essentially, here's kind of the, the, the gist of it here for Alex Dabrinkit. He's, yes, he's fairly young. So people are saying... Why would you trade a you know a forty goal scoring uh, winger who's you know only in his mid twenties? Well, here's the thing: uh, he's going to be due one heck of a qualifying offer after his not on his next contract. He's got one more year on that RFA deal, right? And he's still going to be an RFA and be due a nine million dollar qualifying offer. I'm not saying he's not worth it because based on how he has scored over the last number of years, I think he's likely going to get paid nine million bucks or more. I have no doubt. 
But from the Chicago Blackhawks' perspective, they made it perfectly clear that they intend to strip this straight down, that they're not really overly deep in prospects and, and uh, draft currency. So they plan to move out a lot of pieces and uh, accumulate as many picks and prospects, and it's going to take some time. Kyle Davidson has said on record that it could be five years before they're competitive again. Uh, so does it make sense to have a player who you're going to end up paying you know, $9, $10 million a year into his early 30s before the team is going to be you know, uh, be having a shot at playoffs and being able to have any shot at contending again. I, I don't really think it does. As much as you like the player, you hate to have to move them, but you should be able to get yourself a really good haul that could help this team reset a little bit faster without having him on there compared to if he stays. So, yes, I understand from a fan perspective, fans tend to get attached to their players, especially productive, you know, high-profile players, which I understand, I get it. But if you just look at this strictly from a business perspective, to me, it does make a lot of sense. Now, of course, teams that have been linked to Debrinket include New Jersey, L.A., the Islanders. Um, you have to wonder... Uh, the team like the Islanders, I think there makes a lot of sense. But And we're going to talk about another player they may go after here instead. But I'm just not sure that the Islanders really have the assets that uh, that Chicago will covet for this for this trade. Yes, they can throw in a first-round pick from the upcoming draft. Uh, but it's going to take a lot more than that. So I don't know how much of the future Lou wants to mortgage here. But uh, I don't know if they can get it done. But a team like L.A. is loaded with prospects, also with draft picks. L.A. could probably pick up any player in the league, really, because they have lots of interesting players um, that other teams would love to get their hands on. team like New Jersey with that number two overall pick, could that be something that's involved? Like Those teams, I think, have some of the best chances, and I'm sure there's others too, but those are the teams that you know most people have suggested as being great fits with the right assets that could pull it off. Doesn't mean they, that those teams want to do it. Doesn't mean that they've had conversations. We're just saying that based on what each side was looking for and has, that that makes a lot of sense. So uh, we'll see where that goes. But I do think that there's a lot of reasoning for Chicago uh, to trade to Brinkett. Uh, it's just a matter of time, like Frank Cervelli says. But they will get a great haul in return. You're probably looking at a solid four assets going back. Uh, to help with this rebuild, which will you know accelerate things a bit, here in my opinion. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, Tyson Berry in Edmonton, certainly another player getting a lot of attention. I know the Oilers haven't been eliminated from the playoffs for too long, but certainly lots of talk about what they're going to do. Uh, they are going to absolutely have some change. We already talked about the fact that they may need at least one goalie. They might need two. Mike Smith may not be back next year, uh, and they certainly have... Uh, you know, a tough salary cap situation to navigate through like most other teams here. Can they keep Evander Kane? Can they not? How's that going to work? Either way, Tyson Berry seems to be expendable based on the emergence of Evan Bouchard. Uh, so with a couple of years left and over $4 million bucks, uh, it makes sense for, what you know, a 40 to 50-point defenseman that there's going to be interest. Absolutely, there would be. And if you look at a couple of teams like Pittsburgh, uh, for example, or Dallas, who are possibly losing a very offensively gifted right-shot defenseman, they might be able to get Barry and replace their former player for, you know, only for a few years, mind you, but for uh, a lot less on the cap, right? So you get John Klingberg in Dallas, who's not expected to re-sign there. You get Chris Letang in Pittsburgh. Now, of course, I don't know that we can say Letang is or isn't expected to re-sign. I know Pittsburgh's trying hard for sure. I think there's definitely mutual interest to make it happen, but can they come to terms on a deal? We don't know that yet. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that it's at least skeptical if he's back, just given the fact that we don't know where negotiations are at. So we'll see, but they're both teams that would be continuing to try to you know move forward and win uh, and a guy like Barry could step in like I said at a cheaper price and give you maybe not exact production but similar enough that you're you're happy with the, with the deal right so and there's other teams too for sure that would be the only ones but that comes to mind now having Tyson Barry kind of hit the market here I think might complicate Montreal's efforts to maybe trade Jeff Petrie as well because we know Petrie had requested a trade. Uh, we know he's already made comments saying that he's okay to stay. I don't think he's completely taken back the request, but he's not so adamant that it happened, I guess you could say. I think he'd be fine if it doesn't work out and he has to be a Montreal Canadian. Uh, things have changed enough that he seems to be a little bit happier, which is good. Uh, so no guarantee that Petrie gets moves, but I know there was linkage to teams like the same teams here. I mentioned Dallas and Pittsburgh because of the fact that they might be losing a prominent right shot D and he's under contract for a few years. 
has good offensive skills, but to me, I think most teams would probably take Barry over Petrie. For one, he's a little bit cheaper. You know, with the cheaper contract alone and similar production or better is going to give you, uh, you know, a, a need to kind of navigate that way. So we'll see. But having him on the market to me could complicate a Petrie trade. Once Barry's traded, then whoever doesn't get Barry might be more inclined to, to consider a Petrie move. We'll see. Now, as I mentioned, could we see a Montreal Canadiens and a New York Islanders trade? Now, this is based off an article uh, for the Islanders Hockey Now, uh, obviously, which I'll link down below in the pinned comment. You can read the full article uh, talking about some uh, options here for the Islanders this offseason. Uh, it mentions a couple of different targets that Luke could go after when it comes to uh, a scoring winger to play with Matt Barzell and Josh Anderson's name is brought up. Now, of course, Anderson still has five years on his contract at five and a half million bucks. But I think part of what got people thinking on this is we know Montreal is going through a full rebuild. Now, Montreal right now at this point has had calls on Anderson. We know that. We've heard uh, NHL insiders confirm that there's definitely interest in Anderson from a variety of teams. But up to this point, they've resisted making a deal to trade him. Now, it could be that the offers aren't good enough. And it could be that they just really like the player. And I think it's probably a combination of both. I don't think they're actively looking to move Josh Anderson. I think they uh, they need a few veteran guys to stick around uh, throughout this rebuild and uh, be leaders and veteran players. And I think they're okay if he ends up being that. But like I said, if the right offer comes along, I think they'll move just about anybody there. Um, and if the offers do change enough that they're interested, then I think that'll definitely pique their interest. What the offers have been, we don't know, right? Uh, so it's hard to say. But with Anderson under contract, uh, and of course he played on a line with Matt Barzell at the World Championships just last month, and obviously there's a lot of uh, good production on both sides, and I think that's kind of what got people talking about maybe the Islanders should target him. Now, of course, he plays a power forward, a very much north-south kind of game. Uh, he's uh, good on the rush, good at attacking the net, decent goal scorer, not an overly great playmaker, but Anderson could be a guy that opens up some ice for Barzell. Uh, he's a pretty good skater for a guy his size. Um, so it does kind of make some sense. Now, the article goes through some different options here. For one, it starts off with possibly looking at their first-round pick, number 13 overall. Could they trade that first-round pick for Anderson? But then you have the cap situation. If you only, like, for example, a first-round pick might be enough to get them, to be honest, uh, at a, you know, a decent pick like that. Like, I'm not sure what more Montreal would want. But the Islanders would likely have to attach something because they really need to for cap perspective, right? So uh, the article then suggests maybe they look at Anthony Beauvillier. Now, Anthony Beauvillier, of course, uh, you know, making less money. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, a, a French-Canadian player from the province of Quebec, he may enjoy playing there. I don't know. Um, but certainly we know, it's at least in the past, Montreal's had quite an affinity for, uh, you know, French players. So obviously there could be a fit in that regard. But either way, he's he's younger, uh, which is good. He can score some goals, and he might be a player that they might be more inclined to want to keep through a rebuild than what they have in Anderson. So hard to say, but obviously it would be something that would be interesting. Kiefer Bellow's name also comes up. Uh, some uncertainty there over his future. We don't know really what uh, the plans are for Bellows with the Islanders organization. So uh, another prospect that Montreal might be willing to, to kind of take a flyer on and see if they can bring out some of that potential that he um, you know, showed when he was younger before he was drafted. Obviously, he's had a bit of a rough go that way in the last couple of years. But you also have to wonder that Bellows might get a fresh start. Now that Barry Trotz isn't the head coach, maybe he'll get a different opportunity. It sounds like the Islanders and new coach Lane Lambert are going to be probably taking a bit of a different approach. So uh, it might be a scenario that he might get more opportunity if he stays in Long Island. So we'll have to see about that. But certainly um, there could be some discussions between these teams. I would not be shocked at all if Lou tries to trade his first round pick to acquire a, a, a scoring a winger or a top four left shot defenseman. Uh, to me, I, I think he's going to be scouring the market looking at all those options. Uh, Anderson could be a player they consider. Um, I don't know that he's the absolute best fit out there. I think they'll probably will look at some free agency stuff too. I mean, a lot of it's going to depend on a few players. Like they could look to Minnesota, Kevin Fiala. He might be a good fit. Uh, you got Johnny Gaudreau, of course. You know, it's, we don't know what his status is in free agency. Will he stay in Calgary or will he not? There's Philip Forsberg. Like, there's a lot of other players that are a little bit more higher profile that would also cost more money, mind you. So that might not be, you know, as uh, easy to do. So there's that. But I think the potential for a Habs Islanders trade is there. 
But I'm, I think it's a little premature to say it's definitely something that is going to happen. But I wouldn't be shocked if they at least had some conversation. So let me know your thoughts on this proposed Islanders Hams trade from this article down in the comments. We'll discuss further. Let me know your thoughts on all the other news here from today as well. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Oh.